Please help me welcome to the stage, my story. How y'all doing? Good. Everybody awake? Yeah. Yeah, this is the murder hole, right? I think right now everybody's had their lunch. They're just starting to do this a little bit, digesting a little. I gotta keep you awake for 45 minutes. If you stay awake for 45 minutes, I promise I won't keep you any longer. There's still some folks back in the lunchroom. I think they're gonna be dribbling in bits and bites. Um, yeah. I came all the way from Vancouver, Canada. Um, as a matter of fact, I almost didn't make it here. I, I went to Customs, U.S. Customs, there in Vancouver, and uh, the Customs agent says to me, so you're going to Alabama? I said, yes, I am. He says, you're going to go speak there? Yeah. At a Green Building Conference? Uh-huh. How much you get paid? Because, of course, we're not allowed to earn money in the United States as Canadians. Um, how much you get paid? I said, I'm not getting paid anything. Really? <laughs> And I said, yeah, really? You're going all the way to Alabama, not getting paid. Can you just go in this little room for a second? And he takes me to a little room, and I'm sitting there with a dozen other people. It's 6 o'clock in the morning yesterday, and nothing happens for an hour and a half. I miss my flight. And after an hour and a half, another gentleman calls me up and says, Mark Stoiber, you're speaking in Alabama? And I go, yes, I am. You're not getting paid. No, I'm not. Really? This was his interrogation technique. Really? And then he waited for me to crack. And I said, no. And he saw that it didn't work, so he said, all right, get out of here. <laughs> you could have done this an hour and a half ago. I missed my flight. I had to get booked on a different flight, but I'm here, and I'm super happy to be here. The speakers this morning, unbelievable. I feel like uh, Dippy the Dancing Dog going on after Jerry Seinfeld. It's uh, very, very good speakers. Um, I want to talk to you today about something that I have a lot of passion about. And it is future-proof brands and how it applies to cities. So it's a bit of a twist for a building conference, but I do believe it's relevant. And I was very excited when James invited me here because I believe that this is a vast, untapped area. Now, brands, 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 brands. Brands get a lot of short shrift. They're sort of seen as the poor cousin to products and services. You know, it's sort of, it's the logo and the color that you slap onto something. That's just not true. I believe brands are much, much more than that. I believe brands are incredibly important in our world. Brands enable me to make a very quick judgment on something, whether it's going to be important to me or not, whether it lines up with my values or not. Brands are a snapshot. Brands give you an instant impression of something. Brands enable us to survive and not go crazy in a world that's staggering under information overload. Brands are not simple. Brands are very complex. A good brand takes years of cultivation to build, and it can be destroyed in a heartbeat if the brand doesn't live up to the consumer's trust. Just ask the brokers on Wall Street what their brand is looking like these days. And on that subject, brands aren't just products. A lot of people say brands are products. Brands are a thing. Brand can be anything. Brand can be a product or a service. Yes, it's true. But brands can be people. You know those people who say, I can't be branded. I don't believe in brands. Well, they're a brand too. They're the brand of people who don't want to be branded. You know exactly what those people are all about. Most important for this session though, brands can be places and cities. And I do not believe that we pay nearly enough attention to that. Now, most cities, for better or for worse, already have a brand. They have an existing brand. But uh, the reason I say for better or for worse, for worse because if you don't pay attention to your brand, if you do not define your brand, that brand is defined for you. Cities like New York understand brands really, really well. Everybody knows what New York's all about. Everybody knows what San Francisco's all about. They're defined brands, but I believe that we have a very interesting situation here. That a lot of the cities in this area have the ability to reinvent their brand because they're rebuilding their product. Now brands define their fans. I'm a Vancouver guy. I'm a Harley Davidson guy. I'm a Mac guy. I'm a whatever guy. We align ourselves with our brands. And when it comes to cities, you can attract a certain type of person to your city. Just ask the folks in Silicon Valley. 
You can attract a certain type of person to your city by the brand that you build. So what do I want to talk about today? I want to talk to you today about how you can walk out of this room and actually start building a brand. Perhaps for your company, perhaps for yourself, but what really get me excited is if you started building a brand for some of the cities that are now physically rebuilding in this region. I want to talk about defining what you stand for. One of the critical first steps in building a brand, and I believe also one of the most overlooked steps, is defining exactly what you stand for. There's a trick to this. Once you've defined what you stand for, I want to help you figure out how to claim white space in a consumer's head so that your brand doesn't just stand for something, but it stands for something valuable to your target audience. And find, I, I want to then talk about making your brand future-proof. This is a word I throw around a lot, but future-proof, to me, means creating a brand that is tough and resilient and will thrive in this crazy world of incessant change and cultural upheaval that we live in today. And finally, I'm going to leave you a little bit of homework. I'm going to talk to you about getting outside the jar, and I'm going to challenge you on getting outside the jar. That seemed okay for 45 minutes. Everybody good? You all with me? Nobody's falling asleep yet? Awesome. I like you. Very keen. Before we dig into that, though, let's talk about a couple of very interesting brands that I'd like to tell you about. Yes, this is interesting. This is Samso. Everybody heard of it? Yeah? No? Nobody? Good. I can tell you anything I want now. This is Samso. This is a little island off Denmark. Samso has cows and, and dairy farmers and strawberries and potatoes. 5,000 people, not really known for much of anything, Samso. But that all changed back in 1997 when Samso won a competition commissioned by the Danish government to become sort of a, a guinea pig, a test tube on how to create an emission free place. Samso won that competition. So they set about becoming an emissions free island. And the lesson, the reason I bring up SAMHSA is that there's a very strong lesson in here for anybody who's looking to green a city. It's in how the government officials went about doing it. And yes, it involved beer. <laughs> the government officials could have gone in, like in most places, and said, all right, folks, step aside, we're going to put in a, a turbine here, we're going to put in solar panels here, we're going to put in biomass generators here, etc., 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 just move aside, move aside, move aside and they could have done unto the residents of Samso. And you know what? It would have worked. They would have become emissions free. But it would have been a big headache. Because the people at every turn would have said, no, you're not putting that thing in my backyard. No way, no how. I mean, that happens, that happens here in the States when Mr. Kennedy didn't want uh, wind turbines off the coast of his house, right? They didn't ask him. So the government officials, instead of doing unto the residents of Samso, took a different approach. They loosened their ties, and they went around from hamlet to hamlet on this island, and they sat down with the folks, and they explained to them, listen, you guys have won this competition, so what do you want to do? And they laid out the options. You could do wind turbines, you could do offshore hydro, you could do biomass, you could do solar, they explained the pros and the cons. And they did it in such a way, they actually slid it in, in a lot of cases, in between Here's what your school taxes are looking like. We're looking at fixing the roof on the city hall, and here we're going to put in a new parking lot. It was very low-key. And they always did have beer. That's why they called them the two Borg sessions. So it was very low-key, not a town hall meeting by any stretch of the imagination. What happened? The locals, as opposed to getting their back up, embraced the concept. They embraced the concept. And they own the concept. And this is a very powerful lesson. You see this again and again in successful green projects. Cities like Melbourne, they say what made Melbourne a successful green city is that the locals took ownership of the project. So what you saw in Samso was that dairy farmers became wind farmers without even skipping a beat. In the morning, they go milk their cows and they go check on the turbine. It became just a matter of course. And not only did they not stand in the way of the project, but they helped them build the project so that Samso became Denmark's first emissions-free place five years ahead of schedule. 
Big success as far as a project goes. Now what about the brand? Nobody really thought much about the brand. They just thought about this. Now this is not the brand, right? This is a technical drawing. It's not that exciting when you look at it. It doesn't inspire that gut reaction. It works, but it doesn't do anything more. Nobody really thought about the brand of Samso Green. But a funny thing happened. The brand developed almost organically. What happened was they finished the project, and as they finished the project, to their surprise, in the off-season, the hotels started to book up. And who were the people going to the hotels? They were the local officials, they were Danish officials, they were officials from all over Scandinavia coming to check out this new project. What was it all about? And then the news spread. And then officials from all around the European Union wanted to check it out. And the hotels got fuller and fuller and fuller. Reputation spread. People from all over the world wanted to come see Samso and this amazing emissions free island. Academics came. Activists came. And lo and behold, tourists started to come. <coughs> Today, if you look at Danish tourism books, you will find a page devoted to ecotourism. And at the top, of that ecotourism page, you'll find a write-up on Samsa. This is a brand at work. This is something they almost stumbled backwards into, but it just happened. And not only do they have an emissions-free island, but they have full hotels. And people asking them, how can they do this? What, what they do? Next example, very different example. A city called Curitiba in Brazil. Brazil and Curitiba are as far from Samso, Denmark as you can get. It's a city of 3.2 million people. It's the capital of Paraná province in Brazil, an industrial city. When I got into the whole green brand game about eight years ago, everybody said, you got to check out Curitiba, you got to check out Curitiba. Curitiba started its road down sustainability in the 1970s. And they got into it by an actual conscious act. The government, like every other government in Brazil and South America, was looking for foreign investment. They were looking for companies to set up shop in Curitiba. The difference was that in Curitiba, the government laid out a very clear path as to what kind of investment they wanted. They said, we don't just want companies, we want non-polluting companies. We want companies that are thinking about social equality and environmental maintenance. Those are the sort of companies we want. This back in the 1970s. And what did they do? To attract those companies, they actually consciously started building a brand of green around Curitiba. And one very interesting example of that, around their industrial parks, and in their industrial parks, they created these vast green spaces surrounding the factories, or the prospective factories. What did this do? This sent out a very clear signal to the companies that were considering Curitiba that this isn't just a place to set up shop, probably for cheaper land, but these guys actually think like I think. And you know what's funny? The companies that they got, they were punching way above their class. They got Volvo, they got Siemens, they got Electrolux, they got Kraft. And during the inevitable ups and downs of the Brazilian economy, Curitiba managed to hang on to those companies. So who had the last laugh? I mean, the other cities called Curitiba the golf course because of all these green spaces set up around the industrial parks. But the companies came and they stayed. And Curitiba started to see the value in this brand. And they said, you know what, we have to keep on doing this. Because they saw other side benefits to creating this green industrial brand. One of them was that they attracted a better type of person. This is the mayor of Curitiba accepting an award for the best city to live in in Brazil. Now what if you're voted the best city to live in in Brazil? Now remember, this is an industrial city. This is not Sao Paulo, this is not Rio. This is not one of the cool cities. This is voted the best city to live in in Brazil. What happens is you start to attract people who want to live in the best city in Brazil. You attract the smart people, the mobile people, the people who want to work at all the great companies that are setting up shop there. In 2010, Curitiba was also, also received the Sustainable Cities Award. So they started to build this reputation around the world as a green hub, which again, drew more attention, made the people in Curitiba feel more proud of what they were doing. Now let's not be fooled, Curitiba is not a rich city. 
It is not some sort of playground for, for the rich, the elite, where they can try out all their new green technology. It's not Tom Cruise and, 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 and Angelina Jolie setting up solar panels on their roof. It's not a wealthy city. But what they do have is ingenuity. I don't know if anybody is familiar with the subway system in Curitiba, but this is it. Like every other city in Brazil, their streets are clogged with big, stinky diesel buses. Gridlock. Nobody moves. What Curitiba did, they said, we can't afford a shiny subway system. But what we can do is clear out a boulevard down the main streets of our city, and we can get these big, stinky diesel buses running up and down these lines. No cars allowed. As a matter of fact, what we're going to do, we're going to set up above-ground subway stations. Looks like something they pulled up out of the ground and stuck on top of the ground, so that people find it a little easier to get on and off of these buses. i got to tell you, this was the first picture that I saw of Curitiba. I'm sitting in Vancouver, setting up a green brand company. Everybody says, you got to check out the subway system in Curitiba. Well, wow. Then I saw that, I go, what's that? But all they did was use their innovation where they didn't have the money. Interesting news story. Curitiba now has a shiny new set of solar-powered streetlights that they cannot afford. But there they are. And they got them because companies like Carmana Technologies in Vancouver, or Vancouver Island, went down and gave them to them for free because they want to be involved in a place that is setting the tone for progress in green. So Curitiba, just by identifying that a brand is an important thing, tying it to industry to tell people, yes, green makes sense for making money, started to create this thing that now is making its own gravy. Another very different example. Vancouver, my hometown. You probably know Vancouver for the Olympics. You might know it for other things. Ha ha ha. Yeah, we're hitting the dead zone now, right? <laughs> Everybody's fell falling asleep. Vancouver, actually, interesting side note, absolutely useless information, but our, uh, our economy is based on uh, yearly rankings, is uh, mining, marijuana, tourism. Yeah? Tourism is number two, it's completely illegal, we're not Amsterdam, uh, but every year BC Business, um, in their ratings, ranks marijuana as our number two industry, which makes me very proud. <laughs> Vancouver is famous for a number of things. Uh, James Ricard a while ago showed the, uh, the, vi uh, the video tribute to Ray Anderson. David Suzuki lives in Vancouver. He's sort of our version of Al Gore. Lives a couple blocks from me. Cool guy. Greenpeace was founded in Vancouver. Vancouver is a thought center for green. So what we did, we built that green brand. All right, we've got it built. We've got it nailed, right? Everybody comes to Vancouver, they think we're the Emerald City. TV cameras love us. What Vancouver does not have is business. Successive governments that have been very, very pro-union, anti-big business, have chased out most of the head offices out of Vancouver. We don't have a lot of big business. 57% of our income comes from small businesses, which are 50 people or less. That's not such a great way to build up a strong economy. So our mayor, figured out he had to not only strengthen our green brand, which was already strong, but a bit dissipated, but he had to marry it to industry. This is a very important thing. He took something that we were already known for, green, and he married it to something that we weren't known for, which was business. And here's what came out of it. It's called Vancouver Green Capital. You can understand already the natural fit, green capital, where the capital of everything green, but here the capital has the secondary meaning, which is green money. Now, our mayor is no slouch. He understands branding. He's a very, very savvy brand man. As a matter of fact, in a previous life, he created and, and grew the, the largest organic juice company in North America called uh, Happy Planet. And if you look at him, I mean, this guy knows a thing or two about branding, right? He looks like Clark Kent. He's unbelievable. He rides a bike. He's in all the photo ops. He's terrific. He's a great brand. But he had a daunting challenge in front of him, how to marry green which actually kind of scared business away, and business, how to marry green and business together. What did he do? Like Samso, he got the people who had to live that new reality to create that new reality. And this is very important. 
He got the green leaders together in a room with the business leaders, and he had them hash out a manifesto. What would green capital be? What would green capital stand for? What does it mean? The story, the essence, the philosophy, the values, what we do, what we don't do, how we talk, how we don't talk. He had them actually create a brand manifesto. You can download it. You can take a look at it. And then he went straight to advertising. We started to see ads like this spread up all around the town. We started to see TV commercials and YouTube commercials and interviews with leaders in the local Vancouver business market, people talking about why green capital makes sense. So we started to talk ourselves into this game. And of course, we invited Richard Branson. You can't have a good green thing without Richard Branson, just in case you want to green up your cities. Invite Richard Branson. He'll help. Everybody loves Richard Branson. He even created, he started to create trade missions. So one of our biggest trading partners is China, Vancouver. We didn't just send a trade mission to China to bring business back, we sent a Vancouver Green Capital mission. So everything we did started to be wrapped in this halo of this brand of Vancouver Green Capital. So what happened? Now it's still early days in Vancouver. It's only two years old, this program. But right now, we are the third largest clean tech hub in North America which absolutely floored me. I didn't think we had it. I, you can't see it. It's an invisible industry, I guess. But we are the third largest green tech, clean tech hub in North America. Other benefits. Housing prices are through the roof. Investment is through the roof. We never felt the recession. Maybe it was because of the Olympics. Maybe it's because a lot of Chinese investment is coming in and it's buffering any negative effects. But our housing prices are absolutely insane. Uh, you can see a house here, $670,000, a jump set, $670,000 in seven years. Where else has it done that? And they haven't, we haven't noticed a blip on the radar with the recession. Our housing prices have not gone down. So is it working? I believe it at least has something to do with it. But more than that, I believe that it's starting to attract the sort of industries that believe that green and money can go together. So now I've talked to you about Samsung, I've talked to you about Curitiba, I've talked to you about Vancouver. Three very different cases of places that adopted a green brand as they were adopting a new model for their city. Now I want to talk to you about a work in progress. Detroit. Everybody knows what's going on in Detroit. They've lost half their people. The city was gutted by the recession. The city was gutted by foreign competition. But I believe just as important, the city was gutted by a nostalgic view of industry that prevented Detroit from innovating. But Detroit right now, I mean, they're, they're in a crisis mode. They aren't taking it lying down, though. I don't know if anybody remembers when Seattle was in the same situation. In the 1970s, it was the big joke, with the last two people out of Seattle, please turn the lights off. But a city like that in crisis can come back. Look at Seattle's brand now. They're all about tech, they're all about aerospace, they're all about, you know, computers, they're all about entertainment. Cities can come back. So what is Detroit doing to pull itself back? There are a few very specific things. The jury's out. Will it work? We don't know. That's why I believe this is a space to watch as you're thinking about building your green city brand. Detroit is shrinking and densifying. Anybody who lived in a city 100 years ago, 150 years ago, will tell you, of course, you get people close together, they start getting collaborative, they start getting creative, they live on top of each other, these cool things start to happen. Not only that, though, there's a financial implication. You get people living on top of each other, you don't have to run sewer lines as far. You don't have to have as many police stations or fire stations. Infrastructure gets a lot less expensive when you do this. They're connecting the clusters. There are a lot of little communities in Detroit that are actually very vibrant and alive. You don't want them to be isolated. You want them to feel collective, so they feel a sense of collective power. So Detroit is running rail lines between these hamlets, these little communities, to connect them with one another. Everybody's seen the pictures of the dead Detroit suburbs. Vast areas of land, deserted streets, gutted houses, squatters living there. One or two houses where people are still living and not knowing what the heck they're going to do. Well, Detroit decided to bulldoze those ugly, dead houses and let nature take over. 
As a result, there is a huge green belt starting to grow around Detroit. And a funny sort of side effect, I'm not sure if this is going to last because I don't know if the folks can afford to keep living that far out, but the, the folks who are still living out there are seeing their housing prices go up because now they're facing green space as, a fo as opposed to facing a dead or dying building across the street. And finally, they're reselling existing houses. In Detroit, a lot of people migrated out and they left beautiful houses behind. What the city is doing, instead of tearing down those houses and building new and green, they're refitting the existing houses. So that the city has some character. And the people are moving back. Mostly people, dual income, no kids, or with young kids. There's a rising gay population, which is always a good sign if you want to revive a city. You have a gay population in there, they tend to start trends and things start happening. Farmers markets are thriving. The arts are starting to thrive again. There's a new focus on education because Detroit had terrible schools and they're starting to fix that. And is it working? The jury's still out. Anybody know that? Uh, every, everybody probably knows that Time Magazine actually placed a team of correspondents in Detroit for a year to study what had happened to the city. Most people say desperation in a headline like this, I see hope. Because it says the tragedy of Detroit, how a great city fell and how it can rise again. How it can rise again gives me hope because I see here a city brand that is being rebuilt. And they're starting to connect the dots and they're getting it right. They're figuring out what they need to create a successful city brand. So those are four examples, very different examples of successful city brands or city brands that are still becoming. Now I want to talk about you. I want to give you some tools that you can take back and use as you're rebuilding your city brand. Let's start with the very, very essence. What do you stand for? Now most cities, like most people and most organizations, have no idea what they really stand for. The problem is, defining what you stand for is usually an emotional thing. And emotional things are really hard to define. They just say, I feel it in my gut, or I feel it in my heart. It's hard to talk about. So this brings me to a tool. This was introduced by a fellow named Simon Sinek. Great speaker, good, good, smart guy. He introduced a thing, it's called the Golden Circle. And the Golden Circle, he says, most cities, organizations, or people have no trouble defining what they are. No trouble defining what they are. We are a manufacturing city. We are a port city. We are a tech city. Most cities have no trouble defining how they become that. Well. We have a port here, we have a great industrial park that's all about manufacturing, and that's how we became a great manufacturing city. But very few cities can define why they exist. And the why isn't about making money. Making money comes as you build something. It's a byproduct, it's not an essence. Nobody exists to make money. But think about New York, an example I talked about before. New York, I think, understands their why very well. They understand what they stand for. I'll take a shot at it. We exist in New York to continuously surprise and delight and challenge people with the new and the spectacular and the exciting and the extraordinary and we tie it to commerce. I think that's why they exist. I'm probably 50% wrong, but probably no more than 50% wrong on that. What's nice about the why is if you start with a why, you very quickly get to a how. How are we going to become the city that continually surprises, delights, and challenges people and, and ties that to commerce? Well, first of all, we have to find ways to surprise, delight, and challenge people. The arts, the entertainment, weird people, new buildings, cool things happening all the time, and we have to make money want to flow into our city. So suddenly the how becomes very easy to figure out. And then what? What are we going to become? We're going to become the center of the world. And that's what New York is. This is important stuff. And this is where 99% of branding goes sideways. Because people start with the what. How many, let's take an example Simon Sinek uses. How many computer commercials do you see where they go, this new computer has this, 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 buy it. Eh, right? But then you see Apple and you go, we're going to stick it to the man and we're going to be so cool. And we're going to surprise and challenge the status quo in everything we do. Are you with us? And everybody goes, ah. You know? Even though I'm so uncool, but I still want to be that cool guy. Right? They got me.
They got me right here in that place I can't, ex under, uh, I can't explain. And how do we do that? By building design and technology into, our, into whatever we do that is constantly one step above and is completely intuitive and people friendly and looks cooler than anything else. What do we do? We make computers. Oh yeah, but we also make phones. And we make this and we make that. Can you imagine any other computer company saying, oh yeah, we make computers but we also make phones. People go, what? Right? It works for Apple. Apple could make frying pans. And you would line up the night before and camp out to get the first one. Right? Apple gets what you stand for. Next step. Where is your white space? This is also an extremely important step in branding. And this is another one that people ignore. White space I define as that space in your consumer's mind where you can still stake a claim. A space that isn't owned by another company or person or city brand. So, where is your white space? Well, to define where your white space is, you have to ask yourself three questions. First, is it a natural fit for you? Let's assume that you have a small city up in northern Minnesota where you've grown a few palm trees and you want to call yourself the tropical capital of the north. Is that a natural fit for your city? Probably not. Probably not. You probably want to take something about your city that already seems a natural fit. Are there lots of mountains around? Well, maybe make it natural. Vancouver, we play on, we got great mountains, we got great forests, we got great ocean. We play on that all the time. You see the Vancouver green capital, what are the colors? Green and blue. It's a natural fit for us. Second, is it what your audience wants? If your city is the world capital of manufacturing silly putty, that's great, but I probably wouldn't turn it into your brand. Because there just aren't enough people out there who are willing to come to your city and go, we're at the mecca of silly putty. I don't know, maybe there are. I don't know. But you have to ask yourself, is this brand benefit, this thing that we're defining, is it what our audience actually wants? If not, we should move on to something else. There's probably a lot of things your student stands for. It's picking the one that your audience wants. Finally, is it something the competition can't touch? If you want to call yourself North America's friendliest city, good luck. Because somewhere out there is a city that's a little friendlier or has been friendly a little longer, and they're going to they're gonna eat your lunch. You can't be the friendliest city. You're all, like, if you were awake, you'd be laughing. I think you're just digesting right now. This is, this is a bad example, but how many cities have you seen? The green gateway, the green this, the greenest community. You call yourself green? Good luck. There's always going to be somebody out there who's going to be calling themselves green in a more unique way. Curitiba was green in industry. They were golf courses. They were the first. Vancouver is tying green to money. Maybe not completely unique, but they're saying it pretty loud. They're getting a lot of attention for it. Samso, 100% emissions-free island. Very, very clear brand. Something the competition can't necessarily touch, but they can't touch it except at great cost. So you have to define what you stand for, and you have to make sure that it claims the right white space. Now let's finish off on creating a future-proof brand. Once you've created that foundation of your brand, how do you build a future-proof brand? That is a brand that's tough and resilient enough to take anything nasty that this crazy world can throw at. Brands are built with myriad elements. Logos, design, color, sound, how you talk, how you walk, what do you say? I want to talk about five things today, though, that I believe are essential elements to building a future-proof brand. First, sustainability has to be built in. Now, it's a funny thing. I, like many marketers, jumped into the sustainability game about eight years ago because we thought the aisles were going to be packed with green, that kids in white, long, flowing robes were going to be dancing while Priuses were driving up and down the roads. And that didn't happen. What we're seeing now in my world, the brand world, is that products are incorporating green into what they do. Nike is a great example, but they never talk about green. It's just there for wonks like me to discover and legislators to discover when they want to punish you. So they go, well, actually, they're clean as a whistle. 
So green is being built in. Sustainability has to be built into your brand, not necessarily as the front and foremost. We're the greenest city, but it has to be in there somewhere. And you have to be able to tell a story about it. Innovative. Duh. Any brand that is not innovative today is just going to be left in the dust. I don't think we have to talk much more about that, even though I will. Design driven. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why design isn't probably what you think it is. It's not about window dressing. It's an effective tool for coping in a cultural chaos. I can't believe I got that whole line up. Insight driven. That's what I was just talking about. You can't start with a thing. You have to start with the essence of what you are and how that applies to something that the consumer wants. And finally, social. Everybody's talked about the new trend, social interactivity, social media. I believe that every future-proof brand has to be social. Let's get started at the start. Everybody's probably heard of the triple bottom line. Everybody, when they talk about sustainability, tends to talk about environmental sustainability, and sometimes social sustainability. But as we can see from places like Curitiba and Vancouver, if you're going to build a future-proof brand, you got to tie it to the money. Financial sustainability. And it has to make money, preferably right out of the gate. Because when a baby's being born, that's the hardest time for it to get traction. I'm mixing metaphors now. But it's hard for a baby to get traction, uh, unless it starts making money right out of the gate. Three metaphors, beat that. If it's not financial out of the gate, it ain't gonna last. And if people don't like it, it ain't gonna last. So sustainability has to have all three elements. Here's the thought. Everybody talks about um, eco-density. Getting people to move downtown. I talked about it in the Detroit example. Now here's a great example of how to marry sustainability with profit. You get people to move downtown, yes, you get brownie points, for building a sustainable community where everybody can walk and bike and you get great photo ops and it's easy to sell places for higher than market value. But you know what? As somebody who's in control of the government, you're also going to be saving on infrastructure costs. You're going to have to run less sewer lines, less electricity. The ambulances aren't going to have to go as far. So it's probably going to start saving you money. Maybe not right out of the, out of the gate, but pretty quickly. There's a thought. Innovation. Innovation. <laughs> I'll get to that. Uh, everybody talks about companies and innovation. All, every company is the most overused word of the last three years. It means absolutely nothing. When companies like Apple talk about innovation, though, they talk about constantly innovating and thinking ahead to what people will want and creating that. When cities talk about innovation, though, I think it's useful to embrace another paradigm, which is how can we create an environment where companies like Apple want to come? that then we can build our brand on that. Now, I've talked a lot about what happened in the Gulf with BP because I was a big fan of what BP did beyond petroleum back in the day. I thought they were so visionary and it just came tumbling down so badly, like the brand of the Wall Street stock broker. Now, I often thought, what would have happened if, in addition to the reparation payments to the fishermen and all the folks whose livelihoods were destroyed along the Gulf, the government demanded that BP set up a learning institution, an innovation institution that did nothing but train people in, in sustainable energy and, and sustainable living. And suddenly we started to attract all the smart young people to this neck of the woods and create a sort of a center of excellence for sustainability. I can tell you one thing, the brand of BP would not be that. The brand of BP with something like that in its back pocket would very quickly start to become the folks who saw the light after a terrible experience and decided to walk a new path and actually start to do what they were talking about. Innovation is very important and I believe for a future-proof city brand you have to have the climate that encourages that kind of innovation. It's a shame that we don't have this sort of thing in Louisiana. Design. A lot of people say design is window dressing. You create a product that does something and then you paint it red and that's the design, right? Design isn't about that. Let's, does everybody know the BRIC countries? Brazil, Russia, India, China. What's the mother language? Not English. 
What is happening in North America is a vast migration into North America of people who do not speak English. Not only that, but we see this in Vancouver every day. Our biggest, our biggest migration is from China. Not only do they not speak English as a mother tongue, but their value systems are different. The way they interpret information is different. Design is a tool, it's shorthand, for getting people to understand what you want. For getting people to do what you want. This is a brilliant example. This is a small example. It's a new automatic teller created by IDEO, a great innovation company. And you know what? It's in Spain. And what it, uh, it, what it does, it copes with this problem beautifully. When you go to your uh, bank machine, instead of asking you what language you want to speak, this little fellow walks out. He walks out. He walks out. I've seen a demonstration. He walks out and he waves at you. And if you don't pay attention, he knocks on the glass. And you can hear a doom, 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 doom. And he's knocking on the glass, and he asks you, he points at the PIN number, you enter your PIN number, and then he, he points out a whole bunch of things that you can do, but he doesn't point them out in language, he points them out in symbols. You want to take money, deposit money, transfer money, what have you. And then when the money comes out, he actually, he actually points the different types of money that you can get out of the machine. Would you like two tens and a twenty and da 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 da? And then, when you say, I'd like two tens and a twenty, he takes the money. He takes the money, he grabs it, and he walks up to a little slot at the front of the screen, and he sticks it in, and as he sticks it in, it comes out and it lands in your hands. It is the freakiest thing you have ever seen in your life. It is design non plus ultra. It is exactly what design should do. It should surprise and delight you, and make it for people, make it, make it possible for people from a completely different culture to be surprised and delighted. Think about city brands. Think about street signs. Think about mobility, how people get around. Design needs to be built into your future-proof brand. Insight. James Picard talked about working on the BMW i project. I was blown away by the BMW i project, not because of the electric cars. If folks aren't familiar with the i project, BMW just launched this thing. They said, we are inventing the future of mobility, starting with these electric cars. The key to me is the second part, is the first part of that sentence. We are inventing the future of mobility. BMW's tag right now is the ultimate driving machine. And true to form, they're creating the ultimate electric driving machine. But what they're also doing in the iProject is funding venture capital that will explore how to get people from point A to point B most efficiently and perhaps with a modicum of excitement because BMW is all about excitement. This is a huge, huge insight. Because what's going to happen? In 30 years, when we're all living in mega cities, we're not going to need cars, we're not going to want cars, we're not going to be able to afford to park cars. What's going to happen to BMW? Are they going to die? No, because they've shifted their insight from driving to mobility. From driving to mobility. And what they're doing is creating tools now to help people get from point A to point B in a mega city in the most effective way possible. So they're going to take that, tap that insight, and create BMW 2.0. That's very important. You have to think about what the insight is that is driving your brand. Is it perennial? Will it last beyond the next storm? Will it last if the economy crunches even more? Will it last if the economy explodes? Is it perennial enough? Like they always say, become a dentist or a mortician. There's never a shortage of dead people or bad teeth. Right? That's a good insight. Don't become a mortician. Social interaction. Whenever we say social interaction, we always jump to Facebook and Twitter. But I think it's much more fundamental than that. Brands, the brand world that I grew up in is gone. We used to create brands for people that were show windows. We'd dress everything up beautifully for them. They could only look at it from one side. They couldn't walk around it. Only look at it from one side. And at night, we'd turn off the lights. It would be a mystery. They would have no input. They couldn't talk to the window. Brands have now become a fishbowl. People can walk around the brand, they can look at it from every angle, and what's even more interesting, they can stick their hand in the water and scare the hell out of the fish. And any brand that can't withstand a little churning up the water is not going to survive in the future. Now, you can talk about the electronic side of it, but Sustainable Cities, an organization I'm on the board of, and actually Pat Gordon is uh, one of the people from Sustainability, she's going to be speaking here, I believe, isn't she? Sustainable Cities has a terrific model of social interaction 
Whenever they work with a city to create a new sustainability program, they demand that that city take input from four directions. That is, from the bottom up, from people who are normally disenfranchised, the very poor, the slum dwellers. They have to have their say into what this thing is going to be. From the top down, the king, the boss, the mayor, he has to have his input. From the outside in, people who are completely outside the brand. And from the inside out, people who are on the SWAT team who are creating that brand. So this, in order to be successful, Sustainable City says it has to be completely social interactive. You have to be able to take inputs from everywhere. It will make your brand stronger for it. All right, so we've covered creating the insight, defining what you stand for, future pro um, um, finding the white space to see if that insight actually holds up. We've talked about five elements of a future-proof brand. I want to leave you with a homework assignment because you're going to walk out of here and you're not going to remember anything that I said. But I want you to remember one thing. It's, a, it's not hard. It's a job. And this is the beginning of your brand. My experience is that if you're with a company or working on a project or involved in something for more than six months, you are hopelessly inside the job. What does that mean? It means that the reality around you looks perfectly normal, but you can't see the most obvious things, like the label. Things that people like me looking at the outside go, well, geez, that's obvious. You know? Why'd you build that amusement park right next to the cliff? You know? Why'd you do that? The problem with all of us, and this isn't something that applies to a person of a certain IQ, all of us. We get inside the jar and we don't even know it. So, if you really want to take this to heart, if you do want to build a future-proof brand for your project, for your city, for your community, the first thing that I want you to do is get a global expert team. Your wife. <laughs> Think your wife won't tell you if it's a crazy idea? She will. Your husband. He'll tell you it's a crazy idea. Get your kids. They'd love to tell you it's a stupid idea. <laughs> Gather a team of people who are smart, who have your best interest at heart, but at the same time aren't afraid to tell you if something won't work. People who are good problem solvers. My team, my global expert team, are people from parallel industries who have been through tough things, who know how to solve problems, but have no direct interaction with my type of business. So that I can always count on them for a candid, objective point of view. Then you start the process. You sit down with your global expert team and you say, guys, I think what we stand for, we're going to be the greenest, friendliest city in the north. And your kids are just going to throw you out of the room. Your wife is going to throw you out of the room. You start building your future-proof brand. You start taking them through everything here. And you will get a very, very good idea of what works and what doesn't work. Those are the thoughts I want to leave you with. I hope you take it to heart. After all, the world does need more future-proof brands. Thank you very much for paying attention.